Hello there and welcome. I'm glad that you have decided to come to my presentation today. My name is Cassidy Cash. I'm known as that Shakespeare girl online because I am an artist and historian focusing on the life of William Shakespeare. I'm the host of the podcast called That Shakespeare Life. Each week we take visitors behind the curtain and enter the real life and history of William Shakespeare. Today, I have been invited to introduce you to one of the lesser known Tudor people, and that is the life of William Shakespeare. William Shakespeare's life crosses the line between Elizabethan England and Jacobean England, so the latter part of his life actually falls outside of the Tudor reign, but... Up until 1603, William Shakespeare was, in fact, a force to be reckoned with in Tudor history, and I would like to share his life with you today. In addition to being an artist who paints with paint brushes, I am also an artist of film. So for today, I have put together for you a documentary short film on the life of William Shakespeare, which is what I'm going to share with you today. The life of William Shakespeare is a mystery of sorts. We know several things about the Bard, but there are large chunks of his history that we do not know, either because there's a lack of archaeological evidence or a lack of historical record in the form of documents documents or other ways that we know what we know about William Shakespeare. And of course, we have his beautiful plays and sonnets, which tell us a great deal about his life as well. And we dive into all of these to piece together the life of the world's greatest playwright. William Shakespeare was living right at the cusp of change in the theater industry. His records indicate he pretty much showed up in England and decided he was going to be a world famous playwright. As soon as we have record of him in London is a successful play that he is staging for the first time there. And he's being called out by a contemporary playwright for being that infamous upstart crow. So even if Shakespeare had a climb to get to the top there in London, it was a short climb. He goes from a relative unknown to the top of the heap in a very short amount of time. All indications are he showed up in London and made quite the splash at his very first go. He, shortly after he is making a splash as a playwright, goes on to innovate the theater industry through his unique and pioneering approach to theater structure. The Bard was one of the first to organize a shareholder arrangement for theater companies in his Lord Chamberlain's men that would go on to become the King's men under James I. And then Shakespeare has plenty of drama, as you would expect from a playwright, and goes on to retire after the original Globe Theatre burned down in 1613. He moves back to Stratford and does not playwright again that we have record of. His story is one of many ups and downs, but it is quite intriguing. And of course, he is someone that I think quite highly of. I've built my entire career around studying his life. So today, I share with you the story of someone who is near and dear to my heart. And I hope that this story will inspire you to want to learn something new about the Bard. So I'll quit talking now and I'll introduce you to the documentary short and then at the end of the presentation I'll be back with a short message for you about wrapping up the film and to give you a free gift. So stick around through the end of the show but for now here is the story of William Shakespeare as told by yours truly Cassidy Cash. Enjoy the show. In spring of 1564, England was rife with plague. 
The disease was not well known at the time, and it would strike almost out of nowhere, forcefully, and would wipe out entire towns and villages. Many families would lose their children in infancy or childhood to the disease, and for John and Mary Shakespeare in Stratford-upon-Avon, this reality of losing children before they could even enjoy their childhood, much less adulthood, was quite personal. Before William's birth, John and Mary had already lost two children. One can only imagine their fears and hopes for their third-born child as the christening water dripped over his tiny head inside Holy Trinity Church on April 26, 1564. These two parents could have no idea that their third child, who would grow up functioning like the oldest among his siblings, would not only survive childhood, but he would leave an impact on the world so measurable that posterity would still be in awe of his work close to five centuries after his death. Born in April of 1564, William's birthday is actually an educated guess, as there are no records of when he was born exactly. Holy Trinity Church records his baptism on April 26, 1564, and it's a reliance on our collective understanding of how baptism worked during this time period for how we derive the actual birth date for William Shakespeare. Custom dictated that it was three days after the birth when a boy would be baptized. So since we have the record in Holy Trinity Church of Shakespeare being baptized on April 26th, we track backwards and establish the accepted date for William's birthday as April 23rd. Stratford-upon-Avon was an ideal location for William to grow up. The town was a small one situated on the River Avon. Stratford, as it's often called, had a small population by today's standards, but was a significant town in its day. Stratford-upon-Avon was originally set up as a market town. King Richard I granted Stratford the right to hold weekly markets there, and it created this boon where people would travel there for the craftsmen, like blacksmiths, carpenters, shoemakers, brewers, and bakers, and it was also known for its malting industry, which is processing barley for the brewing of ale. The population of Stratford-upon-Avon during Shakespeare's lifetime was about 2,000 people, and that's tiny in context of today's towns that we typically have in modern civilized nations, but the town was good size for the 1500s to 1800s. And despite suffering large outbreaks of plague in 1564 and in 1645, Stratford's population continued to grow. The town would be officially incorporated under King Edward VI in 1553. The town remains famous today largely because William Shakespeare was born there. The wool industry was strong in Stratford, and one street which remains today, named Sheep Street, bears testimony to its shepherding history. William would grow up to become known as the Swan of Avon due in part to the numerous swans which occupy his hometown and frequent the river there. It can be hard to imagine today that communicable disease capable of decimating the population would be part of everyday life, but plague was a regular occurrence for the Shakespeare family, and William was born right in the middle of one of the worst outbreaks in history, such that William Shakespeare's first remarkable accomplishment in life was simply that he lived to grow up. John Shakespeare was a glove maker in Stratford who would go on to achieve status as a gentleman due in part to his serving in the role of bailiff for the town when William Shakespeare was a young boy. John Shakespeare was in charge of being the town's ale taster. Now for Stratford-upon-Avon, ale and beer making and brewery was a huge part of the town economy. And so there was a certain way it had to be done, certain ingredients that had to be included, and you had to charge the crown approved amount of money for the ale that you were creating. And it was John Shakespeare's job to ensure that this process was followed. He had to function as a kind of town constable. He would be able to deprive what was called single men of their weapons if they were misbehaving, and he also had the power to assess certain fines. When Queen Elizabeth would declare that the church 
had to be whitewashed and the Catholic paintings covered up, it would be John Shakespeare in his official town role there in Stratford-upon-Avon who was responsible for whitewashing them. Interestingly, the material used to whitewash over the paintings is why these paintings survive today, and the whitewash was removed and the whitewashing preserved the paintings. And so they're visible there today, but they were covered up by William Shakespeare's father when William Shakespeare was just a boy. Reportedly, John Shakespeare was not literate. At least he couldn't write. There's no known example of him writing anything down. And the few places that we do have of him leaving his signature, he drew a picture of a cross or a pair of Glover's compasses, which was an instrument used for designing what was going to go on the back of the gloves. And he would draw this symbol instead of his signature. For Tudor people, they didn't learn to write until they had learned the basic skill of reading. And all indications are that this was a fairly specialized, advanced skill that John Shakespeare was never given. William's mother, Mary, came from a well-respected family in the town, and while they were of modest means during Shakespeare's childhood, the family was firmly established in a tightly knit community. Whether or not Mary Shakespeare was literate seems to be a source of contention. People aren't exactly sure. Mary Arden was named as the executor of her father's will, and that's odd because normally the wife would have been named or even a lawyer or something like that. That. So while the skills of Shakespeare's mom aren't known fully, it seems like she probably could read and write because we do have her leaving an actual signature. She sold a land holding to her nephew and the mark on the deed is the shape of her initials. Now, some people worry about this because it appears backwards as an S and then M as opposed to an M and then an S, but the letter S design that she uses appears later when William Shakespeare is writing his name. So it appears that she was using a pretty design and alphabetic letters in a Tudor secretary style of script that she either taught her son or was so popular that he used it then when he was older. Script analysis has shown that because she drew her mark in one continuous movement, that suggests that she wrote it with a quill pen. Their respectability and his father's role as a formal town official is one reason some historians believe William Shakespeare's first exposure to theater might have been during Robert Dudley's famous theatrical presentation for Queen Elizabeth in 1575 when a young William Shakespeare was just 11 years old. This idea does not have historical documents to verify the idea, but the reason that it continues to be speculated is because we can prove that John Shakespeare had an official role as a town official. And along with how unique and elaborate the festive occasion Dudley was preparing for the Queen would have been, and considering Kenilworth Castle is only a fraction of the distance from Stratford to London, being 14 miles away, whereas London is a full 100 miles off or more. It's a strong idea that holds merit to think that the small family would have been sufficiently drawn in by the promise of an elaborate performance and the opportunity to catch a glimpse of the queen that they could have made the short journey to see the performance. While we may never know for certain whether a young William saw the play that night, we do know that some of the unique elements from Dudley's presentation to the Queen show up in the plot for plays William Shakespeare would write in London decades later. Queen Elizabeth visiting Kenilworth Castle in 1575 is considered a huge moment in Tudor culture, and the presentation Dudley put on there included this elaborate production of magic and folklore and 
Sir Walter Scott, in his 1821 novel called Kenilworth, describes this hugely theatrical presentation of Triton riding on a mermaid, nymphs with floating islands, and this mechanical dolphin who was giant being ridden by Arian, who is singing a song. And this is notable because in Shakespeare's play, Twelfth Night, when the ship's captain tells Viola that her brother has survived, he's survived by riding the waves, quote, like Arian on the dolphin's back. There are other striking references which come up in A Midsummer Night's Dream with an allusion to Leicester's designs on the Virgin Queen. The speech is from Oberon who says, Cupid all armed, a certain aim he took at a fair vestal throned by the West. Later in Oberon's speech when he says, since once I sat upon a promontory and heard a mermaid on a dolphin's back uttering such dulcet and harmonious breath, that the rude sea grew civil at her song. These references are so similar to what would have happened there, as well as the fact that Leicester would have been leading Leicester's men with whom Shakespeare was involved and the Burbages were involved. There are a lot of connections. Such coincidences only add to the mystery of whether Robert Dudley's elaborate proposal for the Queen was Shakespeare's first exposure to theater. Another place that William Shakespeare could have been first exposed to theater was actually in his grammar school. Playing, acting, and telling stories was not only a part of established culture when William Shakespeare was growing up, including a way to celebrate holidays, but it was an intricate part of everyday life and a particular addition to the school curriculum where William Shakespeare went to school. The first place Shakespeare was educated was actually at home through the instruction of his mother, Mary, who would tell him fables and tales, which we can see show up in later life, as well as in his plays. Mary would also have taught a young William about the Bible. After his home education, William would have gone to what's called petty school around age seven, where he would learn how to write and how to read and have additional biblical instruction. Just down the street from his home, young William would have walked to school with a host of other boys from the town. Free education was provided to all the boys in the borough. At King Edward VI Grammar School, their curriculum included a focus on Latin, specifically Latin and Greek theater writers like the plays of Seneca, Terence, Ovid, and Virgil. You'll see the works of Ovid in particular appear as reference material for Shakespeare's plays, as well as many of his poems. While in school, students were expected to speak Latin as well as to practice translating texts to and from English and Latin. At the end of each school year, the boys would put on a play to demonstrate their knowledge procured over the previous year. Most boys would graduate around age 14 and undertake an apprenticeship of seven years before entering a formal occupation. It is kind of odd that William Shakespeare doesn't have a record of being apprenticed anywhere. When he left school, it seems largely due to his father's financial troubles. John Shakespeare was removed from the board of aldermen in 1586. We also know that John Shakespeare fell significantly behind on his taxes that in 1578, at about the age of 14, William likely left grammar school that year, although this is sort of the beginning of Shakespeare's lost years period. We have records during this time period that John Shakespeare mortgaged Mary's estate and that there was marriage license officially put together for an Anne Watley to William Shakespeare around 1582. This marks the beginning and the end of Shakespeare's lost year period, where we're not real sure what happened to William Shakespeare during this period, but we know that he did leave school, and then we have later record that he showed up in London. This seems to coincide with William Shakespeare leaving school, but the first thing we hear about Shakespeare the next time he shows up in our history timeline is that he's an established playwright in London. So by all accounts, he picks up and goes to London and sort of hangs his shingle and says, hello, I'm here to be the world However, famous playwright. However, without the discovery of new documents, the years between William leaving school and making his mark in London are fuzzy. And the years after we record him getting married until he shows up in London are known as Shakespeare's lost years because we don't know for sure what he was doing 
during this time. Due to the effects of the Protestant Reformation along with the Renaissance, university education was seeing a huge rise in popularity even among men contemporary to William Shakespeare like Christopher Marlowe. However, there are no indications that Shakespeare went to university. While William Shakespeare didn't attend university as a student, the Bodleian Library started by Thomas Bodley in Oxford was first opened as a public library on November 8th of 1602 and it is considered one of the places Shakespeare might have visited to learn some of the information we see show up in his plays. Not knowing exactly where Shakespeare was or what he was doing after he left grammar school is one of the reasons exactly which one of Shakespeare's plays was his first play is so hotly debated. Henry VI Part 1 premiered on March 3rd of 1592 and is considered by many to have been William Shakespeare's first play but depending on who you ask and which historian you read there is a variety of opinions about which one it might have been whether or not he wrote Henry the sixth part one first or if he wrote Henry the sixth part two first when I was in college, I was taught it was Titus Andronicus, and since then, research has come out to say, no, it wasn't Titus Andronicus, that was just one of the early plays. So, like much of Shakespeare's history, exactly when things happened is pretty hotly debated. For several of his later plays, like Romeo and Juliet, Love's Labor's Lost, Richard III, The Merchant of Venice, and even Henry IV Part I, we do have firm dates for when they were written and when they were first performed. So understanding Shakespeare's history gets a lot clearer in the late 1590s. Our first record of William Shakespeare as a playwright comes by way of an insult. Written in a posthumously published pamphlet called A Grotesworth of Wit, Robert Greene in 1592 and from his deathbed admonishes what he calls a quote upstart crow for allegedly being quote beautified with our feathers. The pamphlet is considered to be a pointed attack on William Shakespeare specifically. Green identifies and complains about an actor that he considers to write as well as a university-educated playwright, but he talks about this mysterious actor using a quote that is found in the true tragedy quarto, as well as in Shakespeare's folio version of Henry VI Part Three. The term in question is shake scene, with shake and scene being hyphenated together, and it's considered a unique term. It's not been found in use before or after Green applies it here, and the Oxford English Dictionary actually uses what it calls, quote, an attack on Shakespeare to define that actual phrase. So even though Green was rather vilified by Shakespeareans and posterity for insulting the bard, Green was, in addition to being a harsh critic of his colleagues, an accomplished writer in his own right. He attended Cambridge, received a bachelor's degree, as well as a master's degree before moving to London, and he was arguably the first professional author in England. This demonstrates that even at the beginning of his playwriting career, Shakespeare began by making waves with big players in the industry. While we don't know much of how he spent his time after he left grammar school, we do know that at the age of 18, William married Anne Hathaway. In 1582, William Shakespeare was just 18 years old and his wife was well established financially and considerably older. Anne Hathaway was 26 years old when she married William. Historians the world over have given great consideration to the age difference between William and Anne Hathaway. They'll cite Anne's pregnancy as a reason to suspect a shotgun wedding or a wedding that might have been forced on William Shakespeare due to Anne's pregnancy. However, modern historians have pointed out that women in Anne's position, where the father died and left her before she had married, were commonly not married off until their late 20s because they would have stayed home to care for younger children who now had no parent. Additionally, the fact that Anne was not William's age suggests he pursued her and intentionally because since she wasn't his own age or within his scope of expected courtship, a relationship her with her would have had to have been something William did on purpose. After his father's financial ruin, William Shakespeare would have had every reason to want to pursue a woman of good standing like Anne Hathaway. Her family was in good standing in the community, and when her father died, he left her substantial financial and land holdings, which would have made her an excellent match for a young and struggling William Shakespeare. 
Without the financial motivations, however, there's evidence to suggest William and Anne legitimately loved one another, as a pregnancy was culturally one way to set up a handfast or probationary marriage. It was kind of an engagement or betrothal, sort of a pre-marriage, if you will. If a man and woman became pregnant together, the expectation was that you intended to marry that person. It was kind of a precursor to legal marriage. In her book, Shakespeare's Wife, Jermaine Greer points out that a great many brides during this time period went to the altar pregnant, and that that status was not the scandalous affair it's sometimes portrayed to be. Instead, there's every reason to believe Shakespeare and his wife, while bound to be married socially as a result of the pregnancy, could have always had the intention to be married from the beginning. Just six months after their ceremony in Stratford, Anne would give birth to their first daughter, Susanna. Just two years later, she would give birth to twins, Hamnet and Judith. Hamnet would die, presumably of plague, when he was only 11. Both Susanna and Judith would go on to survive until adulthood. In 1607, Susanna married the town doctor, John Hall, and they gave birth to Shakespeare's granddaughter, Elizabeth Hall. Elizabeth would go on to die without any descendants, which is why there are no surviving Shakespeare family members today. Judith would grow up to marry Thomas Quiney, a man of somewhat less reputable opinion in the town. He was a vintner and a tavern owner, and though he came from a good family, Quiney was discovered having had an affair with another woman from town with whom he became pregnant. Additionally, Thomas Quiney failed to obtain the correct wedding license for his wedding to Judith, and on the grounds of misconduct, they were both excommunicated from the church. Apparently suspicious of his son-in-law as a result of these events, William Shakespeare would update his will just a month before his death to completely remove Thomas Quiney from any inheritance whatsoever, giving 300 pounds to Judith in her own name and leaving most of the property to Susanna and her husband, John. And whatever their motivations for getting married, William gives all indications of having been a committed family man and in love with Anne Hathaway. Not only does he dedicate his life to providing for her and his children, but his frequent trips to and from London to visit them, even at the height of his career, to visit and handle family business there, suggests he found them and his hometown valuable enough for the significant effort it took to return many times. Stratford-upon-Avon is about two hours by car outside of London, but for William Shakespeare, it was quite a more arduous journey. Traveling most likely on foot for the trip, it would have taken him several days and up to a week to get from his home in Stratford to London. And that's just one way. He would have to then travel that road again to get back to Stratford-upon-Avon from London. Roads as we think of them today did not yet exist, and while there were wagons to hitch a ride on, if you could find them, the journey was much more like the experience of the hobbit taking an adventure than we think of as the relatively easy journey by car that this path is today. Not only were their roads much less navigable, but once Shakespeare did establish himself in London, his work was in such high demand by everyone right up to the top of the government of an entire nation. That reality means that the fact he took time away from work, along with the professional risk of delaying his writing deadlines, with the added expense of travel in general, just to visit Stratford as regularly as is documented, was quite remarkable. Shakespeare would not have been faulted for deciding the journey wasn't worth the effort. And the fact he obviously did find it valuable enough to go to all of the trouble speaks highly of his love for family and his hometown. When you analyze the journey Shakespeare is thought to have traveled along the way, you'll notice that there are many inns for him to stay at. And the frequency of his travel there means he likely had good friends at many of these stops. Historians connect Shakespeare with at least three of the inns along the journey, including the Crown Inn in Oxford, which was owned by John Davenant. It is highly likely that William Shakespeare visited the Crown Inn with each trip to London and back again because William Shakespeare was godfather to John Davenant's son, who was also named William. William Davenant would go on to be instrumental in the continuance of Shakespeare's performing plays when Davenant would hold a theater monopoly in the late 17th century. It just goes to show the importance of stopping in to see your relatives when you're traveling. It could be the key to your lasting legacy.
In the city of London, William Shakespeare wasted no time at all establishing himself as a force to be reckoned with. The early 1590s saw Shakespeare stage Henry VI Part One and Two, which opened to wide acclaim. History plays would become Shakespeare's bread and butter, with the bard particularly gifted at telling the story of England's monarchy, while skirting around accusations of treason that plagued some of his fellow contemporaries with similar tales. By 1592, Shakespeare was firmly established as a leading playwright, having completed Henry VI Part Three, Two Gentlemen of Verona, and Titus Andronicus by 1592, when William was just 28 years old. 1593 to 1594 would see the theaters close due to outbreaks of plague in London, and during this time is when William Shakespeare completed many of his sonnets and famous poems, including Rape of Lucrece, Venus and Adonis, which were dedicated to Henry Risley, the third Earl of Southampton. After the plague epidemic subsided, Shakespeare and other actors who had previously belonged to different companies combined together to form the Lord Chamberlain's Men. This new theater company was under the patronage of the Lord Chamberlain and Richard Burbage starred as its leading actor. The massive hit to the theater industry sustained after the plague brought a necessity for invention within playing companies, and William Shakespeare was ready with an idea that modern entrepreneurs would call disruptive innovation. Along with the Burbages, Will Kemp and other members of the playing company banded together to create one of the first shareholder agreements in London with the establishment of the Globe. The Globe was built in 1599 by Shakespeare's Playing Company on land owned by Thomas Brend. There was a massive lease disagreement with the landowner who sought to force the Playing Company off his property. After a legal scuffle, the men decided they would take their theater and leave Brend with his beloved land. So in the middle of the night, during the dead of winter, Shakespeare and his fellow shareholders dismantled the entire theater timber by timber and moved it across the frozen River Thames to establish a new theater on the banks of the river in Southwark, just outside the reach of London authorities while still close enough to attract the residents for the plays. Shakespeare's success in the London theaters made him considerably wealthy. In 1596, due to Shakespeare's established wealth, his father's service to the town, and his mother's lineage from a gentleman, the Shakespeare family applied for and was granted a formal coat of arms when William was just 32 years old. By the next year in 1597, Shakespeare was able to purchase New Place, which is the largest house in the borough of Stratford-upon-Avon. When his father died in 1601, William inherited his old family home on Henley Street and would go on to purchase an additional 107 acres in 1602. The year William Shakespeare buys New Place is the same year he writes Much Ado About Nothing. He is 34 years old, and it's the first time he's listed as a principal comedian, and he is recorded as being a chief holder of malt and corn in Stratford-upon-Avon. While his professional life was established in London, his respect and status was firmly set in Stratford. After Queen Elizabeth's death in 1603, William Shakespeare's company would become, for the very first time, official patron of the crown. Changing their name due to their new patron, William Shakespeare's company now becomes the King's Men under James I. With this new patronage came a new system of operation for the playing company. They were now required to perform for visiting dignitaries at state occasions and were required to participate in the procession for James I when he was crowned King of England. 1603, William Shakespeare is 39 years old, and this is the same year that we see William Shakespeare recorded as still acting in plays as well as being an established playwright. Ben Jonson's Sejanus gets performed this year, and William Shakespeare is on the players list. This is the same year Shakespeare wrote Measure for Measure, Othello, and gets listed as a principal tragedian. For the coronation, William Shakespeare and his company were given money to purchase a ceremonial scarlet cloth to demonstrate that they were officially under the patronage of the king. While there were nervous feelings about how the new king would receive theater and playing in general, James proved to be an avid theater consumer. Documents from witnesses declared James ordered a public play to be performed every night throughout the holiday season of 1603, and there were additional performances for Queen Anne and the young Prince Henry. Under James, Shakespeare was performing plays more than ever before. 
Jacobean Shakespeare would see the bard write Measure for Measure, King Lear, and perhaps the most pointedly Scottish play of all, Macbeth. Macbeth is considered to have been written by Shakespeare specifically for King James following the gunpowder plot. The gunpowder traders were a small group of angry Catholics who thought that if James was gone, Protestantism would be gone, and they thought they could overthrow the government by blowing it up. They situated explosives below the House of Parliament during a time when all the heads of state were gathered there. Guy Fawkes was captured right at the moment the match was about to be struck, saving James and England from a disastrous attack. After the foiled plot, everyone in England was suspicious of their fellow man. William Shakespeare would have plenty of reasons to want to declare his loyalty to King James, but additionally, it was members of William's extended family, the Ardens, from his mother's side, who were implicated in the plot. Given the state of affairs, it's likely that Shakespeare could have come under suspicion of treason during a time that the entire nation had treason on the mind. Firstly, Macbeth is about treason, and it tells the story of a king who is overthrown and follows the death of his murderers. More pointedly, the character of Banquo is an actual nod to King James personally. King James is said to have been descended from Banquo the Thang of Lochaber when the three witches prophesied that Banquo's ancestors will be king. And Banquo's son escapes the murder plot, and Shakespeare is making the statement, literally as it is performed before King James, that Banquo's historical son, James I, also escaped a murder plot, and that his house, the House of Stuart, represents not only legitimate, but truly descended rulers of England. Shakespeare is using his performance to express his loyalty to the king. Legend even holds that on the night it was first performed, William Shakespeare himself had to fill in the role of Lady Macbeth for a player who fell ill at the last minute. Whether he was bodily on stage or not, it is clear that the play Macbeth was masterfully designed, down to intricate detail, to declare and prove the loyalty of William Shakespeare to King James. While we are now solidly post-Tudor era at this point, after the gunpowder plot would see England adopt the Union flag, Jamestown would be founded in the new colonies of what would become the United States, and the first performance of Hamlet was aboard a ship called the Red Dragon in 1607. Students of the United States will recognize John Smith as the president of Jamestown, which happens the same year that Mary Shakespeare was buried and Elizabeth Hall was baptized. This is also the same time that William Shakespeare was writing his play Coriolanus when he was 44 years old. Shakespeare's lifetime saw a massive amount of invention. The Renaissance was in full swing. When the King's Men bought the Blackfriars was the same year the thermostat was invented and Kepler's first two laws of planetary motion came into being. This was also the same year as the Basque Witch Trials. Tea would first be imported to England in 1610 when William Shakespeare was 46 years old. And Shakespeare's sonnets would be published around this time without his permission. This is also the year that he wrote The Tempest. John Rolfe would bring tobacco to England in 1611 when William Shakespeare was 47 years old. And sunspots would be discovered by telescope the same year the King James Bible was published. Yes, James I was that King James. Galileo was observing Neptune's moons the year before the massive fire at the globe. Surviving the gunpowder plot and coming out unscathed in his reputation as a playwright was just one of the many remarkable obstacles Shakespeare overcame in his lifetime. Unlike many of his contemporaries, Shakespeare seems to have been exceptional at knowing his audience and serving his most influential customer. One thing Shakespeare was equally talented at was diversifying his income. Not only did he run the Globe Theater with the Burbages, but they also established the Blackfriars Theater in 1596. Unfortunately, legal trouble tied up the property for use as a theater, and the first performance of the Blackfriars did not occur until 1609. Once they began performing there, though, the theater served them well as a winter alternative venue when the harsh English weather would force them to close the Globe. In addition to his 
patronages, which paid him money for plays. Shakespeare was also earning ticket sales for daily performances at his playhouses, renting several of his properties in Stratford-upon-Avon. And the bard is thought to have dealt at least somewhat in textiles like wool and even stone. The bard was quite well established financially with many sources of income when tragedy at the Globe would send him into retirement from playwriting in 1613. During a fateful performance of Henry VIII at the Globe Theater, a cannon was fired as part of the production. This cannon was being fired and it caught the thatch roof ablaze, burning the entire structure completely to the ground. Eyewitness accounts of the event tell of how people like Henry Risley, patron of Shakespeare, stood shocked at the spectacle and that the entire structure burned fast with, quote, all in less than two hours, the people having enough to do to save themselves. While the globe would quickly be rebuilt, and this time with a tile roof instead of flammable thatch, the event seems to have been a turning point for William Shakespeare, as he would never write for the theater again. The newly rebuilt Globe Theater remained the home for Shakespeare's old company until the closure of all the theaters under England's Puritan administration in 1642. No longer of use, the original Globe Theater was demolished to make room for tenements in 1644. William Shakespeare lived out the rest of his days in Stratford-upon-Avon and was buried at Holy Trinity Church, where pilgrims from around the world still travel today to visit the grave of the world's greatest playwright. On his grave, Shakespeare placed a famous curse that says, Good friend, for Jesus' sake forbear to dig the dust in closed hair. Blessed be the man that spares these stones, and cursed be he that moves my bones. Such a curse indicates the bard recognized his status in London, and the risk that followers of his work might try to have him buried in the city alongside other great poets, and that one last time William's love of his family and his hometown would be used to keep him in Stratford-upon-Avon, where he could truly rest in peace. Well, what'd you think about the video? Did you like it? I hope that you did. Thank you for joining me today and learning about the life of William Shakespeare. I hope you enjoyed this documentary and that you learned something new about the Bard. To learn more about me, Cassie Cash, as well as to download the gift I have for you today, which is a hand-illustrated map of the life of William Shakespeare from 1564 through 1616. It outlines what the Bard was doing every year of his life, as well as what was going on in England and around the world as they were colonizing the Americas. It's got a little bit of American history in there too, because I am from the United States and I enjoy seeing where the colonies were starting to take shape during Shakespeare's lifetime. And that's included in there as well. You'll get to see the evolution of England's flag and where that happened in Shakespeare's life, as well as other tidbits like that all across the timeline. This timeline is only available to people who sign up for my newsletter, and so I will make it available to you if you sign up for my newsletter as well. But I do hope that you stick around. We study Shakespeare every week with a new podcast episode on Monday and a new YouTube episode on Saturdays that are both free to watch and learn along with us. Thank you for being here today, and I appreciate your time. Have a great day. Bye-bye.